Welcome to the University of Houston and the Catherine G. McGovern College of the Arts. I'm Melissa Noble, the Interim Managing Director for the Cynthia Woods Mitchell for the Arts, Center for the Arts. And we are so thrilled about this co-presentation of Christopher, Morgan K, Christopher K. Morgan with Diverse Works. Christopher was here on campus last week teaching students in the dance department. I know they were enlivened by the time they shared with him. Thank you, Christopher, for that. And I'd like to thank Teresa Chapman and Karen Stokes for their assistance with coordinating the dance classes. The Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center functions as a resource for students, faculty, and staff by supporting a variety of interdisciplinary programs and collaborations across the performing, visual, and literary arts. I'd like to thank Xandra Eden, Ashley DeHoya, and the staff at Diverse Works for their amazing support and collaboration. And now I'll hand it over to Ashley. Thank you, Melissa, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Diverse Works and Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center for the, for the Arts for the Spring 2022 Diverse Discourse Lecture with Christopher K. Morgan. I'm going to give a brief land acknowledgement and jump into my introduction. We believe that truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection, and we would like to acknowledge that we occupy stolen land. The ancestral, uh, occupy stolen land, the ancestral lands of the Atacapa Ishak and the Karankawa people, uh, and recognize native peoples that share the Southeast Texas region, including the Akakisos, the Carrizo Comocrudo, Tonkawa, and Kualantecan. We acknowledge this land as occupied unceded territory and pay tribute to them. We honor their elders, past and present, and future, as well as future generations. We also like to take a moment to acknowledge the Alabama Cachada tribe of Texas, the Kickapoo traditional tribe of Texas, the Estelle del Sur Pueblo, the Lenape Apache tribe, and the band of Yaquita Indians, who are also federally recognized and forced into the Texas region. Christopher K. Morgan's lecture is a part of the Overlapping Territories programming, uh, which is on view at Diverse Works. Before I introduce tonight's guest lecture, I want to take time to say thank you to the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center for co-hosting tonight's talk, as well as express extreme gratitude towards Christopher for, time, for his time and energy that he shared with us this week. For those of you who do, do not know who Diverse Works is or what we do, Diverse Works is a nonprofit multidisciplinary arts organization that was funded by, Houston art, by a Houston artist in 1982. We commission, produce, and present new works with a particular focus on collaboration and community partnerships. Our Diverse Discord program brings curators, directors, and critics to Houston to present public lectures and conduct studio visits with Houston area artists, performers, and writers. The program provides a significant opportunity to connect Houston artists in all disciplines with arts professionals outside of the city of Houston. This week, I've had the pleasure of speaking with Christopher about his native Hawaiian ancestry and how that translates into his curatorial and creative practices. Over the last few days, Christopher has also participated in a series of studio visits with local artists, and it's been through these visits that I've been reminded how important these moments are. As today's lecture marks the first in-person presentation of our Diverse Discourse Lecture and Studio Series program since the start of the pandemic. <clears throat> to introduce Christopher K. Morgan, Christopher Cowie Morgan, he, him, is a choreographer, educator, facilitator, curator, and arts administrator. He currently serves as the Vice President of Programming at the Maui Arts and Culture Center, where he curates dozens of music, dance, and theater performances annually while overseeing the Schaefer International Gallery, a robust arts program, arts education program that serves thousands of Hawaii youth, adults, and educators. Prior to joining the Maui Arts and Culture Center, Christopher served as the Executive Artistic Director of Dance Place in Washington, D.C., stewarding the organization through the pandemic of 2020 and 2021 while maintaining the entire staff with no layoffs or furloughs and continue to pay artists and teachers. In 2011, Christopher founded his dance company, Christopher K. Morgan, an artist. The same, na the same year, the dance magazine profiled him as one of six breakout choreographers in the United States. Morgan, an award-winning artist with years of teaching experience, has recently, com uh, was recently confirmed to join the National Council on the Arts in March 2022. Morgan is, is known as a thoughtful advocate and cultural and, uh, for cultural, 
Morgan is known as a thoughtful advocate for cultural integrity, inclusivity, and diverse representation in, in the studio and on the stage. His native Hawaiian ancestry and a wide range of international performances um, and career influences, um, international performances that influence all aspects of his career, uh, which you will witness here tonight. Please give me a warm welcome to Christopher K. Morgan. I wanted to share a chant with you. In pre-colonial Hawaii, it was customary to announce oneself from a distance to let folks know that you were coming and that you were approaching and that perhaps, hopefully, you were coming with warmth and aloha in your approach. And so um, this particular chant that I'm going to share, um, I like to share in mixed company like this, one, because it's very non-sectarian, and two, because it's um, all about meetings of things. It poetically speaks of where the sky meets the ocean and they lie down to sleep together, and where the ocean meets the land, and the land meets the cliff, and the cliff again meets the sky. So there's this beautiful circularity to it as well. So with that, I awaken. Awaken where the heavens stand and where the heavens lie to go to sleep. I also awaken with your arrival. The sky awakens and the earth awakens. It stirs where the mountain meets the sea. Today arrives the first peng of aloha, of love. I'm so happy to collaborate with my ASL interpreter here. <laughs> Thank you. And just so... Um, accessibility is important, but I want to do the chant once through without the English translation. So aloha again, welcome. It's been really lovely to be here in Houston this past week to meet students at the university, to reconnect with um, long-standing dance colleagues, um, to meet new artists that I was meeting for the first time, to feel the mana, the energy of this place. And I'm really grateful to all of you who have made this possible. Um, to build a little further on Ashley's land acknowledgement, do you want to come up and do a magic touch? <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization and ableism that's embedded within so many of the structures, technologies, and the ways of thinking and working that we all participate in, no matter what our identities are. In a talk a couple of years ago, I heard a Clinkit writer, T-L-I-N-G-K-I-T, um, Ernestine Hayes, uh, she shared this notion that even if Turtle Island, um, what we often call and think of, thank you friend, as the United States now, even if Turtle Island had not been colonized, we would still have, through one means or another, modern roads, air travel, computers, technology. It would have all emerged through the will and ingenuity of human invention one way or another. But had we not been colonized, we would have the foundations of indigenous values to stand on with all of that technology, and perhaps the world would be a different place. And so when we hear land acknowledgments um, and from great institutions that are committed to doing good work, such as diverse works, such as the Mitchell Center, I invite all of us to imagine how we might individually and collectively work towards reconciliation, towards justice, and towards healing. And it's work that I commit myself to through the arts, through advocacy. 
So in Hawaii, um, there's a chant that you would do to announce your greeting. And then when you introduce yourself to someone, we use a practice called mo'oku au hao, loosely interpreted as lineage. And in that, it's not unique to our culture. Many cultures have this. I would often say, my mother was and her mother was. And I might also say, my teacher was and their teacher was, depending on what traditions I might be working in. So um, I thought I would introduce myself a little bit through my mo'oku au hao. So I am the son of Mona Kauka, a Kanaka Maoli or native Hawaiian, Chinese and German woman who left her home of Honolulu, Hawaii in 1953. Uh, she enlisted in the US Marines with a friend right after they graduated high school in 1953. Just like, come on, woman. She studied electrical engineering and learned about segregation when she got off a bus in Mississippi for the first time and saw segregated bathrooms and had never experienced that in her young life. After her time in the service, Mona accomplished many, many things, but not the least of which was raising these eight children, of which I am the youngest. I am also the son of Charles Morgan, a Kanaka Maoli, or native Hawaiian, Japanese, German, and Irish man who left the small fishing village of Ka'a'ava on Oahu in 1952 when he enlisted in the US Marines. After serving in the Korean War, he became a barber. My father credits his early adopter Japanese customers with building his clientele in the 1950s and 60s at a time when other customers refused to sit in his chair because he was mixed race. Some of these early customers of his received haircuts from my father for 50 years. Both of my parents are still gratefully alive. My father and mother met and married in California, where my siblings and I were raised. And though we were far from the islands where my parents grew up, we were raised with values that I later came to realize are inherently Hawaiian. And I developed a really deep love for these islands. I am queer. I'm married to a person of the same gender. I'm a dance maker a storyteller, a stone collector, a laymaker. I'm a connector and a bridge builder. I gather people to do all of this work. I'm an introvert by nature, but my work necessitates me being an extrovert. I am not a kumu hula, the Hawaiian title for master teacher, but I am a student of Hawaiian culture. I'm not a scholar in any field. I'm a college dropout and a practitioner of many things. I'm not a native expert, but I am native. So like you, I'm just one person with ideas and perspectives, approaches, learning, and questions. And somehow I find myself with a privileged platform to speak today. And I both embrace and totally reject this notion of lecture. <laughs> because what I hope we find ourselves in is an opportunity for dialogue, and I definitely want to make sure we save time for that towards the latter part of our time together today. Like many of you, I find myself in between spaces a lot of the time, in gray areas, in liminal spaces, um, in the middle of a rainbow spectrum. And that has done quite a number on me over the years, being in all of these in-between spaces. As an artist, there are these movement traditions that we often pass down from teacher to student or elder to younger, master to apprentice, sometimes even parent to child. And there are stories, songs, histories, mythologies, recipes, passed from body to body through oral traditions, through blood memory, and through our DNA. All of those exist in a dialectic with colonial acts of violence that have stripped communities of their language, their food, their songs, their dances, of culture bearers whose life work have barely escaped invisibility 
and many, many who remain completely nameless and lost to time. There are a lot of modern institutions in our arts ecology today, some of whom hoard their wealth, their funding systems dominated by a scarcity mindset that put artists in competition with one another, dimming our light and diffusing our focus. If nothing has revealed itself more clearly in the past two years, it's those folks that operate under those systems. And all of this is part of my artistic mo'oku auhau, all of it. Somewhere in between all of these things, I find myself flying into the middle. I have little wings today. Um, and I fly into the middle as an artist, an advocate, an administrator. I fly into the middle because I hope to work as an infiltrator, working to affect change within institutions, while admittedly at times I get totally swept up in them. I fly into the middle because I want to honor those who blazed trails before me, those I walk with now doing incredible work in educational institutions and in nonprofit arts organizations, galvanizing communities, and those who I don't see yet coming up behind us. And I stand on really strong shoulders of my family, of teachers and arts workers and colleagues, um, a few whose names I'll bring into the space who were incredibly impactful on me, Donald McHale, John Malishok, Liz Lerman, recently passed David Gordon, Elsie Ryder, Carla Perlo, so many others. And partly, I can fly into the middle, in the gray space, in the liminal space, in some colored part of this rainbow spectrum, because I can code switch, and I can shape shift, and I'm ethnically ambiguous. And these very things have allowed me to survive in the minefields of the nonprofit performing arts industrial complex. And these things also bring me a lot of shame that I can code switch, that I've taken advantage of that identity, that I take these choices and opportunities and work within these systems. Flying in the middle is complicated. And so here I am, decentralizing Eurocentricity in my dancing body and hoping to have an impact on the ways that I can support other artists, collectively impact community with those artists. We're gonna shift because this feels too formal. I'm gonna sit there and maybe you're gonna move too. <laughs> okay, this is better. So, my journey into decentralizing, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Great. <laughs> my journey into decentralizing Eurocentricity in my dancing body began when I was primarily dancing or an interpreter of other people's work. There's a lot of dance folks here tonight. As a young dancer, I was often asked by other choreographers to make a phrase, make some movements, and they would then compose and edit them into a part of a piece. And after doing this for a few years in various choreographers' works, I started to discover that there were these movements coming out of my body that I had learned as a child with my family dancing hula. They had nothing to do with the ballet, modern, and jazz te techniques that we were primarily working within, but they were this muscle memory that I had from being the youngest of those eight children dancing with my family. So at a certain point, I had to acknowledge the way my pelvis was moving and the gestures in my hands had nothing to do with some of these other forms that I might have been in, um, investigating. So that was fascinating to me and I talked with my mother about it. I said, you know, I learned these dance forms from you and our family when I was so young that I didn't have the chance to get an intellectual or spiritual understanding of these movement forms. I really just had muscle memory. So I want to investigate and learn more about this. Do you have an idea where I might go? And she said, without hesitation, your cousin, John Kaimikawa, K-A-I-M-I-K-A-U-A. And so John um, was a master teacher, a kumuhula of 
um, traditions that come from Moloka'i, um, which is tied to my mom's side of the family, one of the eight main Hawaiian islands. My mom immediately made a connection. His unique hula traditions had a lot of floor work in it. And if you all were to close your eyes and imagine hula, you might imagine typically someone standing, their hips swaying, gestures moving. In recent years, we've been seeing through social media the popularization of sharing videos that show more of the traditional ancient hula, lots of um, this has different complexities to it. Lots of buff men with lay on their wrists and their heads and um, you know, these sort of more percussive movements. All of that has truth and, and um, origin to it. But this particular tradition of Moloka'i has an unusual kind of floor work that's a big part of it. And so my mom, having watched me roll around on the ground as a modern dancer for years, really thought there's a connection here, both because of family line and because of a movement style. So in 2006, I um, reached out to that cousin and asked if I could study with him. He jumped up immediately and said yes. Um, we had a few phone calls and emails, and I found an incredible grant opportunity to study with him, uh, a travel and study grant from the Jerome Foundation that would allow me the funding to take time off and dedicate uh, a summer to study. We wrote the proposal. We were awarded the grant. And two weeks after I received the grant, my cousin died. And so it was this incredible um, loss for the family, loss for an artistic, cultural-bearing community. Um, but it also left me with all of these questions as to this strange confluence of timing. It felt like something much larger than myself was at play. So after waiting some time, after contacting the foundation and asking for an extension, Three years later, I ended up going to Hawaii for three months to study with his mother. Two of his students that had been with him for 30 years and were now continuing his work on of his hula school, his halau, and um, had a really life-changing experience that summer. In that time, I did learn some chanting. I learned some dancing. But what I came most clearly to learn was that there was a new path unfolding before me that would take advantage of the unique opportunities I had as a Hawaiian artist working primarily on the continent of the United States, so far from those islands, to share culture in a way that my cousin's hula group never had the opportunity to do. So it became this new responsibility that I started to feel. Meanwhile, I'd started this dance company like a fool and was, you know, throwing all of my money into the hole of creating art in the United States. Uh, just throwing it in that big black hole, take all my money, take all my money, take all the money I can raise, and making art, and loving it, but doing that too. And so there was this moment where I'd been building this body of work, I'd done that research, and I felt it starting to bubble up again. And this was sort of the next phase in decentralizing this Eurocentric vocabulary in my art and in my body. Um, and I realized that there were works that were going to emerge from that research time. I really went that summer just with a curiosity to learn more. I didn't have designs to make a dance, but the research um, created a springboard for some things to happen. So I started making a series of works, and now I realize at this stage that um, I'm in the midst of a trilogy. So in 2016, I premiered a work called Pohaku. Pohaku is the Hawaiian word for stone. And in this piece, I tell stories about my parents along the lines of what you just learned about them and how they left Hawaii in the 1950s. And I trace it back to our colonial past and the economic circumstances that colonization put on our community and necessitated folks leaving in order to find economic opportunity, which was my parents' story in the 50s and so many others. And so in that, I share this story um, and I dance ancient hulas that predate colonial contact. And then I pair them with some modern dance explorations of the same subject matters, because in fact, all of this lives in this body. So that started 
And a lot of the artists in this room know, you know, once you start a question, it's hard to solve it with one piece. Um, we're often making the same dance for decades, <laughs> um, even though it might have 20 manifestations. So that led me to the next work, um, which is currently in process called Native Intelligence, Innate Intelligence. And during that time, I had started to question how often I was summoned as a native artist and a native expert, which I debunked right at the beginning of this talk, um, in art spaces, in funding spaces. Um, and I never felt the ability to say no to those invitations, because if I wasn't there, I didn't know who they were going to get. Were they going to even bother to continue down that path of inviting other native folks? Um, but it created a lot of tension for me internally. And I started to understand, OK, now I'm trying to decolonize, re-indigenize some other part of myself and pull these tethers apart um, and to embrace that no matter the circumstances, no matter the fact that I did not grow up in Hawaii, that I grew up on the continent, those values and the way of being from my parents and inherently my Hawaiian-ness make me Hawaiian, and I can own that in any space. And that's been a very difficult journey. I bring it with me everywhere I am, just like we all do. We all bring our full selves to each space. But I was having trouble letting myself embrace that and own it in these different spaces I was being asked to sit in. So there was another layer of this kind of decentralizing Eurocentricity, Western capitalism um, in my dancing body. a lot to navigate in this talk today. It's like live performance, right? OK, it is live performance. <laughs> um, so as those questions were emerging, I started to ask myself those questions in my artistic practice. Most of my collaborators at the time I was based in Washington, DC, were not native but in fact are all native to somewhere. They all bring these identities with them. And so in this time of having a supercharged political term around native identity or indigeneity, I wanted to question that with these collaborators that I love, that have very different identities in the context of art making. So that um, started to birth this piece, Native Intelligence, Innate Intelligence, that we're working on now. And a very curious thing happened that helped me further um, analyze the multiplicity of artistic disciplines in my work. In 2017 or 18, we had a residency at the National Choreography, Set Choreography Center in Akron. It was me and a couple of dance collaborators and a musician, a visual artist that we were working with. And we took time to look back at the body of my work over 15 years, predating even the founding of my company. And we started to dialogue and analyze, OK, what are the key things that are strong strands throughout this work? Storytelling was one of them. Responding to um, social and cultural issues was another. And then in the movement vocabulary, what I had alluded to earlier as a dancer, these pelvic movements, these gestures, the dancers who had been working with me for upwards of five years were able to pull apart even more how much of it came from hula. Frequently, I would credit brilliant white male choreographers in, in my dance community for some of the work I was doing. So in hula, one of the most basic steps is called ka'o. There's a perpetual movement of the hips that just goes in a beautiful undulation, almost like an infinity. And no matter what step you would be doing, the movement of the pelvis is always there. And so then, in modern dance contexts, I would start to think a little bit about, oh, actually, that's not a displacement of the pelvis and a gesturing leg that comes from William Forsyth. That's me integrating my native Hawaiian dance practices with the Western dance training that I've had. And so I had to then debunk all of these thoughts that I had that these masters, who definitely contribute to who I am, 
but didn't contribute quite in the ways that I had been tracking or giving them credit for, which was a fascinating, ongoing, decolonial, re-indigenizing process that I'm in the midst of. So that was great because I had some collaborators, these dancers in the company that could help me understand that and unpack that. And they knew all of these different traditions and they were learning about hula with me and some of my teachers and they could help me untether all of this. And then to really embrace the totality of who I am, I don't want to stop gesturing my leg. I love that. And I worked freaking hard to be able to do it. <laughs> but how fun it is to do that with this pelvis movement and know that it's actually coming from this place deep inside my DNA, deep inside my history, and connected to my family and this place where they're from. So that's been a big part of that journey. I want to pause there. There's a different subject that I want to bring up, which is about the myth of independence in the Great West. I've been inspired by being in Texas. <laughs> Sandra's eyes just got really wide. <laughs> but before that, I want to see, that was a big, big blah. Um, I want to see if there's things that you want to comment on or talk about, or even things that you've experienced in your own artistic practices or curatorial practices that you've witnessed or experienced that parallel that, poke at that, contradict it, tear it down. Um, what are some of the things that this first part of this dialogue have brought up for any of you? Teresa Friend. I'm going to repeat an abbreviated version because my microphone goes to that camera. So Teresa Chapman, one of the professors here at the University of Houston, was sharing while she was teaching in Taipei, her students reacted to a small movement moment that she did um, with sort of some giggles and some recognition and learned later that that movement that Teresa did reminded of them of something that comes from a traditional practice. And it brought up for Teresa these feelings of connection, um, not knowing exactly where in her pedagogic or teaching lineage that movement might have come from, whether it was from herself or another inspiration or teacher, um, but also questioning, and I'm going to question you back, um, questioning not feeling that with her own Eurocentric um, lineage and background. And so I'm curious for you, friend, um, when I am thinking about this idea that we all are all native to somewhere, at some point here in the United States on Turtle Island, your ancestors immigrated here, and there's other cultures that they are part of. And so what is that lineage, and what are their traditions there that might be informing or could further a next step in an investigation? And maybe you're already doing this, but it's just something um, in these difficult times, and rightfully difficult, where we are interrogating and questioning whiteness in the United States. But I also am curious, whiteness is another construct. And there are specific places that people have come from with their own cultural traditions. So I wonder, do you have anything that is sparked by that, friend? <laughs> and thank you for sharing that. And you know, there's so many of us who have, for a number of reasons, adoption, immigration, migration, slavery, forced migration, like we have these blockages as to how far back we might be able to trace. Um, so to acknowledge that and also to wonder at the possibilities, I think is beautiful. Um, I had a really uncomfortable moment at a conference several years ago um, in Portland, Oregon. It was a National Performance Network conference. And as they were organizing the conference, they had gotten in touch with some local indigenous folks and, um, to do a welcome at the beginning of the conference. And one of the people that did the welcome, as she was identifying all of her tribal affiliations, she also included her Scottish clan. And this ballroom in a hotel of 400 artists and arts professionals, um, I heard this like bubbling of laughter and giggling. And I was so struck by it because no one would dare laugh when she identified herself as um, Duwamish, but they laughed at Scottish. And so like, that's just really curious to me in this time of we're trying, I don't know, I'm trying, I'll say I am trying to really be respectful of different lineages, all of them. And, and definitely some of them are deserving, in my opinion, of elevation amplification because of sometimes centuries of subjugation. However, I don't think it's funny. I don't know, it was just like such a fascinating moment, cultural moment for me and a cultural dissonance. And I was like, what's happening here? And I was like looking around, I don't know, kind of went unrecognized. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited by that, you know, and also like part of my heritage is Irish. Um, and so like learning about that migratory path and part of it is German. Crazy man. 
um, in my family. Crazy man, got on a steamship, it's so um, Titanic, assumed someone else's name, got into New York with the assumed name, um, there was a missing crewman on there. He got into New York on the assumed name, took a, steam, uh, a whaling ship, excuse me, all the way down around South America, ended up in Hawaii, this German man. Then gets a letter that he had inherited something in Germany, some land, and had to prove his original name. And one of my aunts, who's like one of our great historians and documentarians, has a letter from the king of Hawaii, this was pre-overthrow, verifying that this man, my great, 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 great grandfather, I think, um, was actually Edward Azagut and not Edward Patakin, this name that he had assumed, which both of those names still show up in my family now. But he, he like somehow convinced, he was such a swindler, I think, you know, like swindling his way into like getting his way onto the ship. Um, he died in California. We think he was pursuing gold. <laughs> <laughs> we found this other great article too. He um, convinced someone to give them their cattle to post bond for him to get out of jail. We don't know why he was in jail. So, but that's part of my German ancestry and I'm like fascinated by this person who had all of this wherewithal to make things happen in a time where it was so difficult. Um, yeah, overshare, but that you made me think about those couple of things. Um, so much sharing that I've been doing. What else is on your brains, minds, hearts? Uh huh. Uh, and, and, and I should count those because I'm not sure about the number of greats. Um, he immigrated in, I think, like the 18 teens. Yeah, and died in, um, I think he was in his 50s or 60s. So, yeah. I could f contact my aunt that keeps all of that stuff, and my sister has it all too, and find the dated letter. It's amazing. I don't know how they got that. What were you going to, um, sorry, the question was, I, I have to remember to repeat questions. I think the answer did it. I'm going to go on. <laughs> I'm just saying. To repeat for the camera, um, musings on the challenges of crediting artistic authorship, um, collaboration, evolving models of that, um, especially in tense times where, I'm going to throw another word in, appropriation is really sensitive, cultural appropriation is really um, rightfully and sometimes challengingly sensitive. Um, um, you know, you make me think of a discussion that I was having with um, one of the Diverse Works um, studio visit artists yesterday, which is, as any of us, regardless of our identities, it might be queerness, it might be ethnic or racial or religious affiliation, um, do... Um, not do, maybe integrate that into our artistic practices and products and processes. Um, I think one of the most important parts of that process and integration is the depth of the research. And research takes a lot of different forms in artistic practice. It's not just scholarly research, though that's part of it. It might be community building. It might be um, conversations. It might be varied types of artistic processes and products along the way. But the depth of that research to be able to stand and um, justify, uh, I use that word carefully, to justify where you're sourcing from and how you're integrating it, I think is really important for me, um, just as I muse about these difficult things you're grappling with. An anecdote that I would share, I'm just gonna wait for my friend David to come back. An anecdote that I would share is, um, as I started the inquiry into learning more about hula and Hawaiian culture. And that journey started to transition into maybe making some dances. I started to meet a lot of resistance in the Hawaiian community. Um, I met resistance from a museum curator that I was trying to identify and find more photographs from the overthrow period. 
Um, and so I'd been introduced to them through a mutual friend, and they kind of got me into this collection. And this person was very concerned about how I was separating hula movements from the words. Um, in most hula, they really go together. And I was experimenting and playing with, and I'd shared some rehearsal footage with this person um, of me doing hula movements that didn't have the words connected to it. And he was really upset about it um, and shared that with me. Um, and we went through quite a conversation, and we did not end in a nice place at the end of that day. I will say that. It ended very tense. Um, and I was really trying to be respectful and listen and hear that and also be clear, like, one, I'm not putting it out there for consumption yet. And two, um, I have to go through this process to get somewhere. And I'm trying to make sure I'm um, being, we would use the word pono in Hawaiian, like I'm being proper um, in these protocols and in these ways as I investigate. A year later, he did come to a showing of some work that I was doing. Um, and actually appreciated the direction I was taking. Um, so that, was, that felt like uh, a sort of win in a way. <laughs> but um, he was not the only person that I met that resistance with along the way. And I realized I had to get very clear for myself what I was doing, who it was sourcing from, or where it was sourcing from, why I was experimenting, manipulating, playing with it. Um, and sometimes, you know, a lot of my Western arts thinking is like, investigation often bears fruit and I look back on it and see what it means and I still embrace that but when dealing with identity culture bearing history legacy mythology um, I think we're in an era where we can't be lazy about that research we have to really dig deep um, so for me that's part of that there's so much more and I'm sure a bazillion other people have a bazillion other thoughts but thanks for asking me to go there Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I have no idea what time we're supposed to finish. <laughs> um, we've been talking for 45 minutes. We started 15 minutes late. I'm going to go into the myth of the West for a minute because it's uh, right where you started to bring us, friend. Um, so a big part of re-indigenizing my practice, my work, my way of being in the world, my way of interacting in all kinds of spaces has been to acknowledge that I grew up with so many identity politics that taught me to aspire, to be independent, to carve my own way, to forge my own path, to be financially successful and independent, to pioneer new frontiers. Like, I grew up with all of this language in my head. And my parents were the exemplars of that. They left this place that lacked economic opportunity when they were in their late teens and early 20s. They went into sites unseen and dealt with very different social and cultural circumstances. They met each other. They had a family. They put us all through Catholic school on a barber's salary. They did all of these amazing things. And so I just grew up with this aspiration that I had to do the same and I had to achieve. And even when I thought I was starting to debunk some of that and become a wild freeform artist who like didn't depend on the dollar, I still was doing so much of that and I'm still operating in these ways and trying to untether that myth of independence. And so one of the key things that has been helpful to me, you just dug right into, which is why I wanted to continue this train of thinking, is how important my collaborators are. Um, when I started my company 10 years ago, I didn't want my name to be in the title of the company. It's like, oh God, not another single name choreographer company. Like, how many of those do we need? But it was at this strange time where I had started to develop some support in the Metro DC area where I was based. And I had like a half dozen conversations with different folks who I believed in and believed in me and wanted to support me. And they all said I needed to use my name to continue the momentum I'd built as a choreographer independently. And we had this really strategic design where um, the logo doesn't have the name in it. It's just my initials, CKM and A for artists. Um, and so <laughs> it probably doesn't have much impact in the big picture, but it does for me personally and the collaborators I work with. No, none of us call it Christopher K. Morgan an artist anymore. 
we did that for the first two or three years, and then we just really like consciously started to say CKMNA, CKMNA. Makes me think of ODC in San Francisco, a wonderful, incredible dance school and company. That stands for Oberlin Dance Collective. Oberlin, Ohio, where they started like 45 years ago or whatever it was. They've been based in the Bay for like 35 of those 40 years or whatever it is, like decades. But ODC, everybody in our dance community knows that name. So you know, we kind of looked at some of those other models and really tried to decentralize that. Something that I learned about that collaboration um, dependence that I now have is, gosh darn, it takes an investment of time to really start to trust people in a deep way, to share your art with them, to really feel safe, to leave the room and know that they're going to continue to care for those artistic processes, those children that you're growing in your art. Um, and that's something that can't be measured in time, the biggest colonizer of all. That's measured through investing in relationship building and community building. Um, and so that's been a kind of fascinating thing as I try and debunk this myth of independence in the West and the settler colonial mentality that's going back to you know, kindergarten and grade school and how we were taught and how we were raised here in at least you know, the schools that I was in um, in the United States. So I'm very curious about how that intersects with our artistic practices and for those of us that work in arts administration as well and how that supports or doesn't support artistic practice, the practices of funders that are often stuck on fiscal years um, and the project needs to be completed by that year and reported on when in fact the development of that project might be a three-year arc or longer that can't fit into that fiscal calendar and these types of things that you know have this sort of structural dependency on a capitalism, um, a view of capitalism Sorry, I was talking so fast <laughs> with long words. <laughs> so that's something that I've been thinking a lot about and trying to um, yeah, decentralize in my work a little bit. So with that, I want to turn it back to you all and see if you have thoughts on that or anything else or just questions. And especially, um, I think there's a handful of dance students that I met last week that are here too. And so if things that we did in class or things that um, I'm starting to share with you all today bring anything up, I welcome that as well. It's in your minds. Teresa. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm just going to repeat some of it to make sure it's um, audible, which is um, our friend Teresa from the University of Houston Dance Department was um, expressing that they've experienced collaborations where um, they, in hindsight, realized that maybe they weren't as good a collaborator as they once thought and became attached to ideas, and that attachment derailed um, the continuation or the further deeper development of the work itself and those collaborations actually or those projects didn't come to fruition. Um, yeah, I mean the first thing that I think of and I would love other thoughts on this too is the first thing I think of is how much time went into the community building and trust building? Was it enough? Um, and I find a lot of time um, collaboration is entered into in the arts through friendship and affinity. And that's a foundation, but maybe it's not enough foundation. In addition to friendship and affinity, how do we create deep understanding of artistic and maybe even personal lineage, depending on what the work is? How do we create a deep, deep sense of trust? Because then within that trust, and I'm saying this like I'm really good at it. I am working on this so freaking hard, it's hard work. So yeah, um, but like in that deep sense of trust, that's where I think we can often feel more comfortable to let go of the idea and know that everyone in the room is equally invested in caring for it. And sometimes we've been burned when we do let go and there aren't people there to care for that. And so that actually creates a pattern of behavior of lack of trust. And that's why I was saying like for me, it took really 10 years to get some of my key collaborators in place and feel like I could trust them and feel like I could leave the room or totally abandon the music to them or you know these types of things so there's something about you know and unfortunately I think there's an economic relationship to that sense that so many collaborations start with friendship and affinity because we know we can work with our friends for little 
we know they'll invest themselves in it in that way. And that creates another layer of dynamic of inequality as well. And all of that is an undercurrent, I think, when we're working together. Um, so that's some things that come to my mind. Do other folks have thoughts about that? When you thought you were a good collaborator and you realized you weren't and your attachment to something prevented it from being its full self? You're totally nodding, Jennifer. <laughs> Not to call you out, but I did. <laughs> yeah. The reflection was that sometimes a successful collaboration is born out of um, shared working processes without the idea predating um, the work together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in some of the facilitation work that I do, I'll talk about what I call the collaborative cyclone. Um, and I have found in some collaborations that weren't very fulfilling for me, everyone thought we were on a circle and that there's some equality there. And then as a mover, I'm like, but this is very static. We're not going anywhere. Um, and so I started to think a little bit about momentum and energy and that in a collaborative process, this energy will sometimes have something swirl to the top. And in that cyclonic structure, it narrows, right? So that might be a particularly strong idea. That might be a particular person who drives the car for a little while. And then the centrifuge will pull them back down and another idea can emerge or another temporary leader can step up. And so for me, that's been a helpful shift um, in how I work in artistic process. Okay, I know I no longer can facilitate this dance movement. I really need a dancer to step into place. Oh, wow, look, here's Tiffany. She's helping. She's got a great idea. Okay, I know I had imagery in my mind, but I need to let the projection designer go and do what she does so well. Thank you, Kelly. So it's like I, I try and visualize these moments, and there's something unique in, in I'd say, 80% of the work that I make in my company, which is I do come in with the idea, I do the fundraising, and I, I hire a team. So there is like a lot of capitalist privilege in that. <laughs> um, and that's me working within these systems that have created these ways. I, as of yet, have not gotten funding to just work. I work towards a project, and I have to be writing about it two to three years ahead of even getting into a studio. So this is a system I would love to see change, and I know a lot of funders and artists have been in deep dialogue about this for decades. How do we upset that system? It hasn't really happened yet until you get to that really upper echelon and you get the big $250,000 Doris Duke Award or the $600,000 MacArthur, you know. So, <laughs> but there's, there's something in this swirl that I love, and knowing you as a mover, I bet you can find something in that too, just to share a little tool I, I like. I want to move the voice around. Anybody else? Yes, Rima. Yeah. Just to repeat, um, um, briefly, beautifully said, so I don't know some iteration of it, <laughs> um, working on a, a mobile game with a number of collaborators. And um, Rima was uh, having a moment of realizing what they did and didn't know and needing um, the entire collaborative team and creating an open forum to facilitate their, them to step into their own strengths. Um, and that furthered the project and wasn't focusing on anyone's weaknesses, but everyone's strengths to help move things together forward. Um, that did not do justice to everything you just shared. But something you excited me about um, is technology. And I think technology is, can be a really great re-indigenizer, decolonizer, like source, open source technology, even as simple as Google Docs, like when everyone has editing power and artists can go in and like look at a writer and be like, and not just like send you back a PDF with a red line slash, but actually comment and say like, here's what I'm thinking. And you can be in direct dialogue. Shared knowledge is so amazing. And that's one of the ways that I think technology can be such a powerful tool right now. Something about the mobile game made me think that. And it's like, I'm so excited about it. Um, and I'm imagining you with collaborators like in, you know, shared documents or Slack or some other device and um, platform and like how that can actually accelerate that dialogue too, which is so cool. Caitlin. Hi. Hi. Um, our friend Caitlin was sharing that in her artistic process. Um, she's really feeling the challenge of 
funding cycles that have these finite timelines on things and processes that um, don't fit into that, and then how that requirement of the final product can put a stress on um, or, or shift the dynamic of research and process and investigation and creativity to entertainment. It's not a great paraphrase, but an okay paraphrase. Um, It saddens me that how often when I think about things, it goes into some kind of train of thought that leads me to, oh, if there were just more resource, which is so often dollars. And I'm really trying to pull myself away from dollars as resource because we are rich with many, many resources. And I'm on this kick where I'm thinking about money is the most renewable resource we have because it's totally fake and we just print more of it every day and like people invent new cryptocurrencies like all the time so like let's spend it <laughs> especially in the last two years um, arts institutions do not hoard your endowments spend it go beyond the five percent that's you know the mandate like just spend it get it out there um, and um, I, I, I hate that I am so drawn to this, but I'm, I'm hearing this thing about time, and in our structures, time is facilitated by money. I think in an earlier part of my career, I would just lie to myself a little bit and say that these finished products were finished products when I knew they weren't. And you know, I was saying a little while ago, like sometimes we find ourselves making the same piece for 10 years. <laughs> um, and I started to really embrace that and acknowledge for myself and maybe with some of my trusted collaborators, okay, we're gonna put this on stage, we have a show coming up, we're gonna do it, and then in three months we're gonna revisit it all. And, you know, and, and sort of meet that requirement and shift the script um, internally. For me, I started to get to a place of privilege um, maybe five-ish years ago where I had relationships with venues and funders that I could really start to think in much longer arcs of engagement. Um, it, arcs of engagement that might include, you know, community activities that inspire the research. Um, and I know we know artists in common like the incredible Giselle Mason, I'll summon her name into the room, who is working in these really long arcs of engagement, right? And that, um, that started to be afforded to me with time and privilege. Um, but I wonder for all of us, and I wonder for my younger self when I was trying to trick the system more, could I have been more thoughtful about strong relationships that I had that could have given me more time and space? Um, you know, I think about all the places that I taught over the years, and I didn't ask for space from them. Um, for example, as a movement practitioner, there's lots of ways, different disciplines, we need different things, but like space is a premium for those working in the dance arts. There are so many places that I taught at and I probably could have been using the quiet hours between 10 and two before after school programming started. Like just ways of thinking about resource sharing that I didn't take advantage of that I often, I'm like now like, oh, I should have, gone back to that university that was, you know, empty for three months of summer and seen could I have gone into their space? Hi, Houston. Um, you know, like these types of things. Um, that musician that I did a gig for and I realized I never went back to them and saw if they wanted to score with me and I had the best time with them and I, you know, it, it takes a lot of person power to do of that, person, um, person hours. Um, but I, I wonder if I could have bent that funding better to my advantage through some help that I didn't ask for because I was shy. <laughs> because I was shy and, and thinking, I don't know, I'll just say for myself, like doubting myself, doubting my art, like all of those things came up and I still do that, but now I don't care. <laughs> um, I don't know. There's a lot of identity politics in it too, friend. Please. I don't think our, in my lifetime, I don't think I'll ever see our, our government funders, whether they're city, county, state, or federal, get there. Um, the taxpayer dollar or the hotel tax or whatever it is that's funding it, the responsibility to that, I think it, can, I think it will get better, but I don't think it'll get there. I wonder about private philanthropy. Um, I think private philanthropy, some brave funders dip their toe in it. Uh, a 
curiosity and a concern that I have with private philanthropy is like a lot of times there are these like multi-year initiatives that they investigate or invest in, excuse me, invest in. And so it's like we might be doing five years of arts funding in a certain way or seven years of arts funding in a certain way. And then they strategic plan and shift focus and they might even move away from the arts to health and human services or, you know, so I worry about there's a sustainability question that I have in private philanthropy. You know, and, and when we think about those big awards, I named two of them a moment ago, Doris Duke and, and the MacArthur, like that is that, but my goddess, how hard done, how many years do you have to work to get that? You know, and, and how much have you already thrown into the big pot of making art? $600,000 from MacArthur sounds like a lot, but I know a lot of those artists spent way more than that over the course of their lifetime before they got that award. And not to diminish that award, please, baby, please. Um, but you know, like, yeah, the, the big equation, ooh. So yes, in a sector is my thought. Does anyone else have a thought about that? Please. Totally. Totally, these intermediary funders who redistribute funds and do have more open-ended timelines. Yeah, I think currently the creation funds through the National Performance Network, partly informed by the pandemic, but they're giving, I think, five years uh, for process. Um, creative capital is similar. Um, what I love about NPN, National Performance, Network, National Performance Network's creation fund, and a lot of their funding is they're moderately competitive. They're not like insanely competitive. Creative capital, yeah. over 4,000 applicants the last round. Oh, yeah. For, um, and they upped the number for, I think it was 50 awards this year. And that was up. What's the percentage on that, mathematicians? <laughs> yeah. So yes, 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 yes. And whew. I mean, that incredi incredible um, Houston-based arts initiative that was funding black, indigenous, and people of color um, arts groups at Six to a Wagon as part of, I, someone help me with the names of that. Yeah. What is that? B-A-N-F? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the B-A-N-F here in Houston. Great job, great work. I heard from several artists, really simple application process, really uh, m modest expectations on reporting. These are words that we want to hear. <laughs> Very understanding staff. Um, so it's happening. It's happening. Our friend Karen from the University of Houston Dance Department. No, it's OK. It's OK. I just want to make sure it gets archived appropriately. Um, was reflecting on the arduous labor that's required of um, artists, small arts organizations, mid-sized organizations that don't have the budget to pay for grant writing and grant reporting staff to do all of the data tracking, to do all of the reporting, to do all of the applying, um, and, and that it really creates a whole other industry that um, detracts from the artist's time in the studio or in their process, in the, in the art studio, in the dance studio, in the theater, um, creating their work and is something that we need to reinvestigate and rebalance. For me, one of the things that I'll respond to before we wrap up with that, or something that makes me think a little bit about is, um, I mentioned the word infiltrator um, in my self-introduction. I hope to be an infiltrator into different types of spaces. And um, that needs a lot of allyship. We need a lot of friends infiltrating these spaces. Um, and this summer when my nomination for the National Arts Council came, I was with a group of artists and one of them was this fabulous dance maker from a really underground scene in LA. And I just kept joking with him, but you know, jokes always come from truth, right? I kept joking with him, like, when I get in the White House, I'm just gonna call you on your cell phone and be like, what should I, what should I burn down? What should I tear down? <laughs> Erase that part. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like, um, how many dance people have been in those positions to be in that dialogue, and I don't know that it'll affect the change that I want to see. One of the biggest things that I hope for in this incredible opportunity that I've been given is to really reassess the lack of individual artist fellowships that went away in the 90s due to the culture wars. Like, I don't know if that has any chance of changing in my lifetime, but gosh darn it, that had a really severe, sad impact on our US art scene. And I think it started to infiltrate the value of culture you know, in our entire society, if we're not investing in artists from a federal level in a meaningful way, not just institutions, in humans, then it's really hard to value them, in my opinion. 
yes, arts education needs to bubble up, yes, but like what are we preparing them for? Hopefully a life in the arts and we need to sustain that as a community. So um, it, it's, you know, an, an individual fellowship would have a very different reporting requirement than a, a big program that's meant to serve hundreds or thousands of people. And, and so how do those things mechanize to bring back some of these opportunities that have less strings attached, less reporting requirements, less um, or maybe deeper understanding and appreciation for differing arcs of time, which respects different cultural perspectives, which respects differences in how we communicate, how we build community, how we collaborate. So um, yes, and I hope I can do a little bit of that work, and I invite you to infiltrate all of the institutions that you can, burn them down from the inside, reinvent them, rebirth the new thing. Um, you know, there's great institutions doing good work. Um, it just takes a lot of us to make that sea change. So with that, first, let's all take a deep breath in. Ah, and exhale. Breathing deep has been very, um, I've been very shy about breathing deep these last two years. And I've been thinking a lot about it because the word aloha, which is the most commonly known Hawaiian word on the planet, literally means the breath of life. Ha very logically, especially for my dance friends in the room. We often exhale with a nice ha. Is the breath part of life is alo. So just indulging in and experiencing that we're in a room, in person, with people, in a way that we haven't been able to for some time. Um, I want to thank all of my great friends at Diverse Works for inviting me here. Sandra, Jennifer, Ashley, thank you so much for having me be part of this. My friends from the Cynthia Mitchell, Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center. I knew I was going to mess up the order of those words. I should have just said the Mitchell Center. <laughs> Lisette, Melissa, Rima, thank you so much for having me here. My friends from the University of Houston Dance Department, Karen, Teresa, John, you're here with us and so many others. Thank you. Um, and I hope to continue uh, this relationship. Please reach out to me. Oh, wait, here. This needs to be on the video. You can find all of us. Oh, we're going to need Ashley's magic thumbprint or something. Come on, goddess, give us a thumb or a password. Perfect. There. There we are. <laughs> My friends, thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>